Okay. Hello, everyone. This is my presentation. Um, I have my friend Jack here watching. He hasn't seen this presentation yet. I just thought it'd be nice if someone was actually watching. Uh, feel a little bit more real of a presentation. Okay, here we go. Okay. All right. So my presentation is about uh, British colonization of India before and after basically the first war of independence, which was in 1857. Yep. Okay. Let's see how do I switch to... Okay. So basically, uh, as you guys might know, Britain colonized India for like a really long time. It was about, I think it was about 400 years, roughly they colonized India. And um, it started off with not technically Britain, it was called the East India Company, the British East India Company. So they were founded in 1600 and they built the first factory in India in 1612. And like the main reason they built the, um, the company initially was mostly just to trade. They had like, there was a lot of goods in India, a lot of spices that they wanted and they wanted those spices and they wanted to turn a profit in Europe and in Britain. So that was the first reason they made the company. And so like when they first entered India, this was during um, the Mughal Empire or like a really high point in the Mughal Empire. So the Mughals controlled basically all of India in the 1600s. And like over time, the Mughals like declined in influence in the 1700s. So this guy, uh, Aurangzeb, he was the seventh Mughal Empire and he was like considered by many like the last powerful emperor of India. So like, around like the 1700s, like after his death, the subcontinent broke up into a lot of multiple states. And there were like these uh, regional rulers called Nawabs. And um, so let's see. So this was like pretty good for Britain because like India was kind of broken up now at this point and there were all these kingdoms and this made it easier for them to consolidate power within like specific regions. So they had like a ton of influence in this area here which is Bengal in uh, Calcutta. This is the Indian spelling. And this is the British spelling here, Calcutta. So like the, the, British East, uh, the British East India Company used a lot of like capitalist tricks and coercion to basically trick the Bengalis. And like the Nawab of Bengal was pretty unhappy about this, but he just didn't have that much power to do much. So let's see the, so like a lot of the abuse of power included not paying taxes, illegal expansion and like failure to subsidize a lot of like the Bengali farmers. So this, um, let's see. Yeah, so like the British really had like a ton of power. They had modern weapons and they kind of knew that there, there wasn't much the Indians could do other than like just kind of do nothing. So they basically cheated a lot. So, and like at this point, this is right after the British took over Bengal, but these are kind of what the empires looked like uh, right before uh, the year 1750. So there was like this Bengali empire and they were fighting a lot with this empire, the Maratha empire. Okay. So in 1757, the Nawab of Bengal, he holds the, hemp, the, the company headquarters under hostage because they're really just abusing their powers. So, Let's see. So this battle was led by the British. Oh, wait, no. It was led by this guy named um, Robert Clive. And so the company had like their own army and they won the battle. And this was like a pretty big moment and like a shift where like the British were doing mostly like not fair trade, but not just basically stealing from India to basically taking over and stealing directly from India. So they put in a puppet Nawab after this who basically adheres to the British and the company. And this like starts a period known as like the great British power grab. And so this was like a chain reaction. Once they took over Bengal, they kind of realized that they want to take over all of India. So this guy, Robert Clive, he was the, the governor general who took over Bengal initially. So this period was like a 200 period after um uh, 1757 for like 200 years and that was called the great loot of india and basically the british just took a ton of money and resources from india over the next two centuries and this robert clive guy is kind of interesting um 
in like 1774, he actually committed suicide because uh, Britain, what did what happened with Britain? He got, I think he got acquitted for like doing a lot of stealing from India and something like that. Anyways, he's not a great guy. So let's see. So yeah, so like over the next basically like a half century, uh, England takes over most of India. So they fight a bunch of Anglo-Mysore wars, Maratha wars, and in the north west quadrant of India, these two wars. Yeah, so this is a picture of the British fighting some Indians. Okay. Yeah, so this is this pink region, this kind of shows uh, the, um, the company influence or the company rule in India. So this was in like 1765, right after they took over Bengal. And over time, you can see they're getting, they acquired more land. And then by 1857, which was the year of the revolution, they controlled a lot of land in India. Okay. So yeah, the 19th century. So basically a third of India is directly controlled by the company at this point, And two thirds are controlled through these things called the subsidiary alliance and the doctrine of lapse. So the subsidiary alliance basically says to like the Nawabs of India, okay, we're gonna protect you from these other kingdoms and you know, yeah, basically the other kingdom of India, and you have to pay taxes and open up to British trade and basically basically just do what we say. And, you know, these Nawabs are like, okay, like there's nothing they can do. And then the doctrine of lapse says that when a Nawab dies without a male successor, the state would be taken by the company immediately. So like over time, a lot of the land in these, uh, basically controlled by these mini kingdoms were basically taken from these Nawabs and yeah, that's what happened. Okay, all right, so some of the conflicts during this period, there was the British versus Indian conflict. Well, there was just a ton of conflicts overall based because, um, because of the British. So there were a lot of Indian versus Indian conflicts, class versus class conflicts, Hindu versus Muslim conflicts. And a lot of these conflicts had to do a lot with the fact that it was just a really highly diverse country, a lot of like, different castes fought with different castes. And there was like a system before in India, before the British came where there was easier ways to resolve conflict, but with the British in power, basically everyone was kind of just on their own at this point. So let's see. So, but like, it's kind of clear that the root of all these conflicts come from Britain. So Britain basically hurt every class in India to like the, basically the bourgeoisie, which would be the, the kings, the Brahmins, the Imams, so those are like religious leaders and landowners. And they also like really hurt, obviously the lower classes, like untouchables, merchants, artisans, farmers, laborers. So yeah, basically every, every group of people in India lost privileges when the British came. So some examples of lost privileges are like, so these are some landowners, so I mean the bars, and they, they basically just had all their land taken from them. So usually they would lease it to the peasants and the merchants to use. Um, and they would take like a small amount of tax from them, which, you know, when added up was a lot of money, but the British basically took all the land and did the running themselves. And what the British did is they came into these farms and they, they basically increased the tax a lot. So like a lot of these farmers, they would go and trade their goods with like a smaller tax, but now the British are taxing a ton of this, but none of that money is coming back to India. It's going straight to Britain. So a lot, so there you see like 11 major famines in India between 1757 and 1757, no, 1857. So a hundred year period, there was like 11 major famines with multiple millions of people dying. And then another example is the merchants. The merchants were hit like really hard. So like before, you know, or not the merchants, the artisans, excuse me. So they, you know, they would make goods like clothes, baskets, um, you know, they would have specialty, basically skills, maybe like plumbers or something. Um, and yeah, so like they would, this, this is how they made a living. And then when the British came, the British, wanted to only sell their goods. So they said, you can't create these goods anymore. And they basically lost their whole livelihoods, pretty much all the merchants. 
So an example is there was a, there were some, let's see, what do you call them? Tailors in like Bengal and they used to like sew like these clothes by using a needle that they use when they put a hole through a nail in their thumb. No, not a nail, no, a hole in their nail in their thumb. And so like the British would come and they would cut the nail off their thumb and they eventually figured out a way to basically put that hole directly through their thumb to sew. And the British started just cutting off everyone's thumb who had this. So it really, they, they really had it pretty hard. So everyone's, everyone's hurting. The kings, the peasants, the landowners, everyone's losing privileges. So let's see. So this definitely like worse than Indian versus Indian conflict. Like before there was sort of like, like a mutual kind of system where pretty much everyone ate, everyone kind of functioned in society relatively well. I mean, it was very unequal as large societies are, but people weren't starving to death. And there was like a system of governance and law. But now like basically everyone's being stolen from and people resort to cheating and illegal systems to get, you know, food and wealth. And, um, you know, this is very comparable to like what we see in the US and like poor communities versus like, you know, other third or other first world countries. Other first world countries have pretty low rates of crime because everyone eats, everyone has basically what they need. But in the US, um, yeah, a lot of people don't. So that's the reason obviously there's more crime. So, but the thing that made this different than like the US or something is like everyone knew who the enemy was. Everyone knew, okay, these British guys suck. Like, you know, and this kind of created some solidarity between different Indian groups. So everyone kind of knew, like, what it, we, you could call it racism or like racial um, preference, but everyone was like, like these British guys suck. Like they're stealing our stuff. They're screwing us over. So that, that, was, um, that was like a big factor in India at the time. And then you see, you see like a lot of revolts before the Sepoy revolt, you know, there was many, a lot of mini revolts, but they were just so, I mean, I guess you could say militaristically primitive. They didn't have any like strong weapons, but this one, this one was special because this was a big revolt and it involved modern Western weapons. Okay. So now we get to the, the Sepoy revolt, also known as the first uh, Indian war of independence. So this was the largest armed conflict in colonial India. And it was between the Sepoys and the British. It spanned basically pretty much all of India. It, it didn't really reach too much of the South. And this was like a major moment in colonial Indian history. So the Sepoys are basically a military, like, well, they're Indian soldiers who work for the British East Indian Company. And, and there was like about 5 million right before the, the, um, the revolt began. So, so to begin with, there was a, like a lot of tension between the Sepoys and the British. First of all, they were like treated super unequal compared to like their British constituents. You know, they were getting paid 10 times less than a British person doing the exact same job. And they were like, you know, really made fun of for being brown and degraded. So there was like a lot of religious oppression in um, among, well, the British suppressed their religious uh, rights. So I guess one example is a lot of the Brahmins and the Hindus really identified highly with their caste and there were certain rules in the caste. So one time they uh, had like a fleet try to go to Myanmar and there, and in Hinduism, if you leave the country, if you cross the sea, that's like considered, you'll, you'll lose your caste pretty much. So a lot of, a lot of the supporters were like, no, we're not going. And the British just killed them all who said no. And that's like a big deal because like a, the caste, especially at this time in India was like pretty much the root of all life for an individual. That's your family, that's your community. That's just who you are. So like losing caste, especially for like the Sepoys who were mainly like Brahmins was a huge deal. So um, let's see. And also for the Muslims, they were really anti-Muslim. Um, I think they were yeah, I think they treated the Muslims worse than most of the Hindus. I'm not exactly sure why, but there was a lot of racism toward Islam or prejudice towards Islam, I guess. Okay, so the breaking point happened basically when the British 
gave the um, new cartridges for the rifles that included pig and cow fat, which are like, uh, well, pig fat or well, eating pigs in Islam is like the highest level of sin, which, so that's just like really bad, really bad. It's totally unacceptable. And the same is true in Hinduism. If you eat anything with a cow or it's basically just, it's just like the worst thing you can do in the religion. So they were pretty pissed off at this. And this was the breaking point. They were like, okay, we're gonna, we're gonna revolt. So this in the area called uh, Awad, they first revolted. So the Muslim sepoys took over Delhi. They killed a bunch of British and they reinstated the Mughal emperor uh, Bahudar Shah II. And this gave a lot of momentum to the cause because people, because back in like, especially the Mughal days, uh, Hindus and Muslims alike were treated better than under the British. So a lot of people were pretty excited at this. And this kind of caused, this, this uh, really started the revolt. So the sepoys take over Delhi and they sent letters all over India saying, come join our, our movement. And a lot of people were like, yeah, let's join, especially like the sepoys who were really pissed off. So half of the 5 million sepoys joined the rebellion and started fighting basically against the other half of the sepoys and some of the other British. So the major leader were uh, these, these three people, Nana Saheb, Kunwar Singh, and Rani Lakshmabai. Uh, let's see. So this is kind of where most of the revolt happened in this Northern region. Um, so these are like major areas where the revolt was happening in Awad, Delhi, and Chansi. Okay. So, and in the end, this was a pretty, this, this rebellion failed. And the main reason it failed was just because there was like a serious lack of purpose. People were fighting, not like with a vision of the future, but they were just fighting because they were angry and they wanted to gain back their lost privileges. So you know, this meant like a lot of different things for like Muslim, Hindus, peasants, merchants. And there wasn't like, there wasn't very much organization. They were pretty much just fighting. And so this caused like a lot of people to side with the British because they saw it as, they knew that the British would really screw them over like later on if the British won. And so they joined the British thinking that they would still have, you know, more privileges in the end if they sided with the British. So even like the uh, Shah Bahudar II, he, he was pretty much coerced into being the Mughal emperor and he was just a figurehead. And he was mostly kind of unsure of what the revolt was about. And he even kind of like switched sides by the end. Okay, so there were like a lot of pros to this rebellion though. So this, this like really inspired like the later generations of Indians because it, it really had like a lot of unity between classes overall, even though it wasn't very successful, it was very symbolic, like, because they, they, the Indians really like put the British on their heels, like, they could have won, to be honest, it, it just didn't have the, that much unity. So it showed the weakness of the British. And it showed basically the strength of like what India is like when they unite and fight together. Um, and it also showed like the shortcomings of like the armed rebellions because they lost. And e so even with these modern weapons and a ton of sepoys, they still lost. So it kind of showed people, okay, maybe these, this armed like fighting, you know, maybe we can try some other things. So especially like later on, like intellectuals like Gandhi and Nehru, they, you know, they push for like peaceful protest, which ended up working. Um, and this, this was pretty cool. So the, like this uh, lady, Rani, Lakshmi or Rani of Jhansi, she was like, she became like a huge symbol of like resistance to the British Raj, which was when Britain directly started to control India. And she was like a pretty, pretty awesome figure. She, she basically, um, she fought to the very end and she was like, maybe like the most loyal person to the rebellion and fought the whole time until she was killed in battle. Um, yeah, let's see. Anything else? Yeah. So basically after the rebellion, we see a lot more Muslim Hindu solidarity because they're really, they're realizing they can be, they'd be better off working together. And this kind of like triggered 
well, maybe not this event, but later on, a lot of intellectuals and thinkers began to like imagine a new India. And this really helped like, um, you know, when India really got independence, uh, basically to see what India would look like, not basically going backwards to the Mughal empire, but going forwards to like a democratic state where everyone's equal. And uh, so the British Raj, so after the rebellion, the British directly took control of India and it was no longer the company, the East Indian company, which was really pretty much the British, but this was more direct. Um, yeah, so just looking at the conflict, this is a pretty classic example of hegemony. Um, Britain has basically full control of India. Um, all resolutions are basically resolved through brute force and coercion. It's a pretty classic example of oppression and colonization. Um, and yeah, after the rebellion, there's still a hundred more years of British rule. Uh, let's see. So these are some of my sources. And yeah, that's, that is it. Let me stop sharing my screen. All right, Jack, do you have any questions? Yeah, that's a good good presentation. Um, one of my questions has to do, I guess, with um, what, how with race. So, do you think how much of a factor do you think race was um, in the British colonization of India? Obviously, you know the British were pretty. Uh, I wouldn't say they're very open-minded during that time. <laughs> Um, but do you think the colonization would have been different if, say, the Indian people mostly uh, were constituted of like a bunch of white people or something like that? Or do you think it would have been the same uh, result? I mean, I mean, they were pretty racist towards the Indians. They they called them like indigenous and like. I'm I'm not sure. I I can't. I don't, I'm not sure how to answer that. I think. I don't know. I mean, I think overall, it probably would have been, well, like they were white and they shared similar values. I'm sure they would have found better ways to trade, more fair ways to trade. I mean, they really viewed India as like a primitive country with a lot of resources that they inherently deserve to take. And that was kind of like the mentality back then. So yeah, that's how I would put it. Yeah. Nice. I think that's a good, that's a good spot. Okay. Is that it? I can ask another question if you want. Um, you mentioned that like life for, you know, every caste in India had been affected by uh, British rule. How do you think, um, how do you think the untouchables were impacted by the British rule and how were their lives made worse? Well, I mean, I mean, it affected everyone. So like before, like in India, they, you know, if one region wasn't producing as much food. A lot of times they would, you know, send some food over to this other region and it would be like a subsidized for most people. I mean, because it negative affected like the upper class people and the lower class, I'm sure they were like probably less charitable because they were like kind of trying to like, uh, you know, basically work for themselves. So like whatever small things were like given to the untouchables before were basically like nothing when the British came because, you know, they had nothing to give. So, I mean, I'm not certain, but that's, that's, that's what I would probably think would happen is what happened. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. I think we're done. Thanks for watching my presentation, Jack. I hope you guys all enjoyed. <coughs> Bye. -bye. Cool.